All right, welcome back from the break. I think this is uh, my turn to introduce my uh, esteemed uh, co-chair, Dr. Benson. Uh, Dr. Constance Benson is a professor of medicine at the University of Te uh, California, San Diego. And she wears so many hats that I'm surprised she hasn't developed a cervical vertebral compression. And one of her, she's a senior attending physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases, Director of Infectious Disease Training Program, Director of Antivirus Research Center, Principal Investigator of the CD4 Collaborative HIV Clinical Trials Unit at the University of California, San Diego, and President of the Croy Foundation. And she is an internationally recognized researcher and clinician and has worked in the field of HIV AIDS uh, for the past uh, 40 years. And uh, most recently, her research has focused on the treatment and prevention of HIV-associated tuberculosis. And as you saw her say earlier, also um, the uh, guidelines for, for the management <clears throat> and uh, development of rapid point of care diagnostic assays for resource limited settings and new antiretroviral drugs development. So welcome, Dr. Benson. And thank you very much for that nice uh... <clears throat> introduction, especially about the cervical compression. <laughs> so these are my financial relationships with ineligible companies. Um, none of these are related to today's talk. The learning objectives are outlined here, and you can review those at your leisure in your syllabus. So let's move right into our, our cases. I'm going to start with a case presentation from our own clinic. This was a 40-year-old man who has uh, is a history of MSM and drug use, who was diagnosed with HIV about five years ago. Um, he presents to our clinic currently with fatigue, fevers, headache, weight loss, diarrhea for about a month. He did not report any cough or sputum production. Pre-antiretroviral therapy at the time of his original HIV diagnosis, his CD4 cell count was 190 cells per microliter, and he had a relatively high viral load of 423,000 copies. He had not received PrEP previously. He had no past history of OIs. He did have a history of untreated hepatitis C virus infection. He was originally reluctant to start ART at the time of his ART of his HIV diagnosis, but he did agree to pneumocystis prophylaxis. And after a couple of years of follow-up in our outpatient program, he did agree to start ART and receive dolutegravir, 3TC, and abacavir as his initial regimen. He did well for about a year and then uh, unfortunately had some difficulty with drug use and intermittent poor adherence and fell out of care. So the first encounter back with us in the healthcare system is his return to care visit with these symptoms. A diagnostic evaluation included an exam, which was remarkable for hepatosplenomegaly that was palpable. His laboratory studies showed pancytopenia, although relatively mildly so. He had an elevated alkaline phosphatase, total bilirubin, and liver transaminase levels and his CD4 T cell count was 43 with a viral load of about 200 copies per ml. A chest X-ray was performed despite his having no cough or sputum production, and he did have uh, scattered reticulonodular infiltrates on a chest X-ray and an ultrasound of his abdomen confirmed hepatosplenomegaly. So this is just a curiosity uh, question for you all, what diagnostic tests would you order first for this patient based on his clinical presentation? Unfortunately, you can't choose all, so you just have to choose one. So this really gets to what you think is the most likely diagnosis in the differential diagnosis. And I guess it's kind of cheating since you know what the topic of the conversation is, but Okay, so I think most of you uh, were concerned just as I was for an acid fast bacillus infection or mycobacterial infection. And the two most uh, necessary kinds of diagnostic tests in that setting, given that chest X-ray would be sputum AFB smear in culture, and then perhaps um, blood or bone marrow cultures for mycobacteria. 
So let's move on to uh, continue the case presentation. So our own diagnostic testing included a little bit of everything because of the headache. He did have a lumbar puncture performed, which showed his cerebral spinal fluid to be normal. And he had both a negative serum and CSF cryptococcal antigen. His sputum AFB smears were negative. He did have a sputum sent for culture and the liquid culture was still negative after 14 days, but solid culture continuing to be pending. He underwent a bronchoalveolar lavage because of his chest x-ray findings that was negative for AFB and for pneumocystis. He had no positive bacterial cultures and subsequent blood and bone marrow cultures were both positive for acid fast bacilli and subsequent, subsequently grew mycobacterium avium complex. So here's a, one of our pretest questions. In this setting, what would be the most appropriate treatment for what sounds like a patient with disseminated mycobacterial infection in this setting? We have four choices, clarithromycin plus rifibutin, and delayed initiation of ART, azithromycin plus ethambutol and immediate initiation of ART, clarithromycin plus ethambutol plus rifibutin and immediate initiation of ART, or azithromycin, ethambutol, moxifloxacin, and a delay in initiation of ART. So make your choices now. About 40% of you got this uh, response correct in the pretest, so. And looks like we're still at that level, so good. So I'm not gonna immediately tell you the answer, but we will go over this in detail as we get through the lecture. So uh, just as our other speakers have done, I'm gonna do a little bit of microbiologic background to mycobac about mycobacterium avium complex. As you know, this is a non-modal bacilli. It has acid fast bacillus staining characteristics and growth characteristics that are similar to M tuberculosis, meaning that it's a slowly growing organism on solid media, it may take three to six weeks to grow, on solid media culture, but we more often will use liquid culture mechanisms now. And this generally will grow in about 10 to 14 days in most people. There are four clinically important species within this complex, and that's based on genotyping, M. avium, M. intracellulari, M. scrofulatium, and M. chimera. Each of these cause clinical disease in the appropriate setting. And they all are generally intracellular infections. The cell-mediated immune system is the most important um, component of the host response to this infection. The organisms generally are found inside macrophages, although there is a period of time when they are present and replicated in the bloodstream. And infections occur most commonly in those with cell-mediated immune deficiencies. B cell function doesn't really play much of a role in mycobacterial um, response in host response to mycobacterial infections. So uh, also similar to our other speakers, I'll touch on a couple of epidemiologic points. Because non-tuberculous mycobacteria also encompass M. avium complex, there's been a lot of recent data written about non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. And why is that? These are ubiquitous environmental organisms. They're found in soil, water, food, and biofilms. There are more than 170 known species of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. There appear to be some higher prevalence in coastal and Southern states, although this does not hold up for people necessarily for people with HIV. In North America, the most common non-tuberculous mycobacterial species causing infection is mycobacterium avium complex. And the second most common is mycobacterium abscessus. And while the prevalence of tuberculosis has gradually decreased in the US over time, lung disease due to non-tuberculous mycobacteria has been increasing in prevalence at a rate of about 8% per year and currently is more prevalent than tuberculosis in the US. Um, this is just adding to that um, detail in the shifting epidemiology of NTM cases in the US and looking at 
for sentinel surveillance locations for both extrapulmonary and pulmonary disease, you can see that MAC remains the most common species. And the age group in which we see this dis disorder tends to increase or tends to be higher as age increases and more common in female than male individuals. Underlying lung disease, GI tract disease, malignancy, diabetes, and HRV are the most common underlying conditions. But this just highlights the point that HIV is not the only condition in which we see mycobacterium avium complex infections. And so I just like we've asked several of our other speakers to comment on this point, in people without HIV infection, there are a number of risk factors that are seen with mycobacterium avium complex. And the most frequent of these is underlying chronic lung disease. Most importantly, cystic fibrosis, chronic bronchiectasis, and for those of you who see inpatients or outpatients in the transplant setting, lung transplantation. There is a unique syndrome that in older literature was referred to as Lady Windermere disease, which was associated with lung infection due to mycobacterium avium complex, tended to have a predilection for older women with bronchiectasis, low weight, and had underlying structural defects, such as scoliosis, pectus defects, or mitral valve prolapse. There also appears to be a genetic predisposition to mycobacterium avium complex. This is particularly notable for those who have an interferon gamma or IL-12 receptor defect, Hairy cell leukemia is a predisposing feature, possibly also genetically related. And more recently, there's been a distinct syndrome of disseminated MAC disease described in those who have Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease or MSMD syndrome. Other risk factors in, the, in people without HIV include long-term therapy with anti-TNF-alpha treatment, for underlying conditions or high dose or long-term corticosteroid therapy. Obviously in people with HIV, immunodeficiency is the principal risk factor. You heard already from our introductory talk about the overall incidence of mycobacterium avium complex disease in people with HIV. And these generally seen in people who are not on effective antiretroviral therapy and who have a CD4 cell count of less than 50. So I'm going to make some comments that apply to both people with HIV and without HIV. More often these days, in the era of more effective ART and people um, diagnosed earlier with HIV, we tend to see more localized lung disease with MAC in adults than in the old days of more disseminated MAC disease in people with advanced immunosuppression. This is also true, of course, in people without HIV. Usually this presents as an indolent, chronically progressive granulomatous or interstitial lung disease. I've already mentioned the underlying lung conditions, but in people with HIV who may be on ART but have incomplete viral suppression or may have CD4 T cell responses that are not robust in response to ART may develop localized pulmonary MAC. The signs and symptoms tend to be a rather indolent, indolent presentation of chronic cough, sputum production, weight loss, and fevers. And as I've already mentioned, it tends to be a pulmonary condition with reticulonodular changes and infiltrates on that are bilateral, although occasionally cavitation similar to what we see with tuberculosis can be seen. Other localized syndromes that are caused by MAC in people with or without HIV have been reported in the literature and have been seen clinically. And these include central nervous system infection with brain abscess or meningitis, osteomyelitis, bursitis, pericarditis, skin lesions or skin and soft tissue abscesses, and more notable in younger children, cervical lymphadenitis or what's referred to as scrofula, and this may be more common with Mycobacterium scrofulaceum. So what are the clinical features of disseminated MAC in people with HIV? And these are illustrated here. And this tends to be a disseminated multi-organ system disease. Symptoms are nonspecific and include just as our 
uh, the clinical presentation in our patient, fevers, fatigue, weight loss, diarrhea, abdominal pain. It's a subacute or chronic presentation, usually with symptoms gradually increasing or progressing over weeks to, to a couple of months. Laboratory abnormalities often include anemia, and the anemia may be out of proportion to other laboratory abnormalities because there appears to be an interaction with mycobacterium avium complex and um, uh, red cell production in the bone marrow. Um, elevated liver alkaline phosphatase may be an isolated finding or again, may be out of proportion to other elevations of liver transaminases. Physical exam, similar to our patient presentation, shows often hepatosplenomegaly and may have diffuse peripheral or central lymphadenopathy as well. Um, I've already touched on localized disease, but it's also something to think about in people who have been on ART with higher CD4 counts as a manifestation of unmasking or paradoxical iris. Um, in people without HIV disease, there are specific criteria for the diagnosis of localized lung disease. And this has to do with the fact that mycobacterium avium complex and other NTM can't colonize the respiratory tract or the GI tract and may confuse the diagnosis. Clin this therefore requires a combination of clinical symptoms and exclusion of other diagnoses, plus the radiologic findings I've mentioned and a positive culture, either from BAL tissue biopsy or at least two sputum samples. In people living with HIV, the diagnosis of disseminated MAC disease may be a little easier and generally requires isolation or is manifest by isolation of MAC from the blood, from lymph node tissue, from bone marrows, or other biopsies of other infected tissues. Speciation is not difficult. Most clinical laboratories do this now with nucleic acid testing or PCR or through whole genome sequencing. And there are a host of other tests that can give you the actual species of the organism. And this is important because different species may respond to different antimicrobial therapy. Ancillary tests I've already mentioned, and I've already talked about the issue of colonization. And while it may be present in asymptomatic patients, colonization may also be a harbinger of active disease in the right setting. Treatment of disseminated MAC disease, and this is based on the updated guidelines from the NIH, CDC, and IDSA guidelines that we've mentioned previously, should consist of initial therapy with at least two drugs to prevent or delay the emergence of resistance. The, there are three, two different preferred therapies listed in the guidelines, and these focus on a cornerstone of treatment with a macrolide-like compound, either clarithromycin or azithromycin, in combination with a thambutol. It is currently recommended that you test for susceptibility to clarithromycin or azithromycin if you choose to use these drugs, especially if the patient has previously received MAC prophylaxis. People who fail MAC prophylaxis have a substantial rate of resistance to clarithromycin or azithromycin, and this will influence response to therapy. So this is an important adjunct diagnostic test in this setting. The duration of therapy is at least 12 months, and usually it's continued until there are no longer any signs or symptoms of disseminated MAC disease, and a sustained increase in CD4 T cell counts to greater than 100 cells per microliter for at least six, six months. And this obviously implies that the individual has started antiretroviral therapy. And I'll touch on specific uh, recommendations for that in a moment. But I do wanna also touch on the point about whether there's a need for more intensive therapy for disseminated MAC. In the pre-effective ART area, era, we used more intensive therapy for MAC routinely. Whether or not this is necessary now, if you have access or if your patient has access to effective antiretroviral therapy is less clear. More severe disease and those at higher risk of early mortality due to MAC 
might be those who have a very low CD4 cell count, a very high MAC load in the bloodstream, and you can actually quantitate this. Um, and many of the laboratories uh, who do blood cultures for MAC will do this for you, or the inability to access effective ART. There's also a higher likelihood that you will need more or different therapies if drug resistance might be a possibility after failure of MAC prophylaxis. If you do deem that your individual patient might be a candidate for more intensive therapy because of some of these criteria, most experts would recommend adding a third drug, rifabutin, to the regimen. And if disease is very severe or if there's a high likelihood of drug resistance, a fourth drug might be added. And candidates for that fourth drug include uh, fluoroquinolone, such as levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, or an injectable aminoglycoside, with amicacin generally being used more frequently than streptomycin. Refractory disease or treatment failure um, is defined slightly differently for individuals who do not have HIV infection and those who do. But if you suspect refractory disease or treatment failure, it's important to retest for drug susceptibility and to use at least two drugs in a retreatment regimen that have not previously been used and are likely to have activity. There are a number of alternative drugs that do have activity against MAC, and this has mostly been seen not necessarily in clinical trials, but in observational studies, in case reports, and in in vitro assays. Medaclin, tadizolid, linazolid, and omatocycline are all individual compounds that have added activity against MAC and can be combined with some of the other drugs that I've mentioned when you need to use them for refractory drug-resistant disease or treatment failure. So how do we define, define treatment failure or refractory disease? The definition or case definitions for treatment failure in people without HIV who have localized lung disease due to MAC include uh, lack of a clinical response after up to six months of what we consider to be optimal therapy, as I've defined it, or re-emergence of multiple positive cultures or persistence of positive cultures while still on treatment after 12 months of therapy. And why wait so long? And this is that because many individuals who have chronic underlying lung disease will have relapsing infection, progressive evolution of drug resistance, and may require repeated courses of antimicrobial therapy. And so it's not always clear whether it's their underlying disease contributing to their symptoms or whether it's really treatment failure. Recurrence or relapse obviously is designed, defined by recurrent or re-emergence re of positive cultures after initiation or cessation of treatment. What, so what are some of the special considerations regarding antiretroviral therapy? In, I think I'm missing a slide here, so somehow I'm not sure how that happened, but um, in people with HIV disease, the, let me get, there we go. Um, I'll go back to these other slides in a moment, but I've gotten myself out of order here and I apologize for that. So monitoring response to treatment, I, as Dr. Armstrong mentioned with pneumocystis, we sometimes get a little anxious because response to treatment in people, particularly if they have advanced um, immunosuppression in HIV and are not on effective antiretroviral therapy may be quite slow. Symptoms may begin to resolve after two to four weeks, and delayed improvement may be seen in those with more severe disease. Current guidelines suggest that you repeat blood cultures or bone marrow cultures if blood cultures are not uh, positive for people with MAC in four to eight weeks after starting treatment, especially for those who do appear to have a slow response to therapy. If blood cultures are resolving or the mycobacterial load is reducing, you should continue therapy and just wait for a little bit longer for response to treatment. We do see iris and both unmasking and paradoxical iris in those who are started on antiretroviral therapy. 
And the risk of iris is particularly strong in those individuals who have a CD4 count of less than 50 at the time you start antiretroviral therapy, who have a rapid or marked decline in their HIV RNA, or in some case reports, we have noted an elevated alkaline phosphatase may also be a predictor for the presence of iris. Treatment of iris is the same in this disorder as with any of our opportunistic infections and may require corticosteroids for more severe disease. It may be long, take longer to resolve, as you saw with the severe iris syndrome that Dr. Armstrong presented, and repeated courses of corticosteroids may sometimes be necessary. There is a notable syndrome of severe iris that's associated with hemophagocytic lymphocytes lymphohistiocytosis, or HLA. This occurs in people who appear to have a genetic predisposition to this syndrome, and this may require additional immunosuppressive therapies. So special considerations regarding antiretroviral therapy in uh, people with MAC disease really relates to the fact that Antiretroviral therapy is also a cornerstone of adequate treatment for MAC disease, and people with disseminated MAC should receive fully suppressive ART. ART and MAC therapy should generally be started at the same time or as soon as possible after starting MAC treatment, and this is particularly important because randomized clinical trials have shown that immediate initiation of ART in this setting reduces the risk of additional OIs, which are increasingly common in people with CD4 counts of under 50. And it also is associated with a, a rapid, a more rapid or improved response to MAC treatment, particularly in those with very low CD4 counts. Obviously, careful attention to drug-drug interactions is necessary in monitoring MAC treatment. These are just some of the key adverse reactions seen with clarithromycin, azithromycin, rifabutin, and ethambutol, and the key drug-drug interactions. And with this slide, I just want to point out that the both the OI guidelines and the antiretroviral therapy guidelines share a drug-drug interaction table online for its use in evaluating drug-drug interactions when you do start antiretroviral therapy in people receiving MAC treatment. So let's just finish up this discussion with um, ob obviously preventing MAC would be more important in people with HIV than in treating it. As you saw from the individual that I presented, and this is an unfortunate example of people who fall out of care and may stop their antiretroviral therapy, or in people who present very late, as Dr. Danaretti talked about earlier in this symposium, and may have advanced immunosuppression at the time they present with their HIV diagnosis. Based on the fact that even in that setting, the rate of occurrence or the incidence of MAC disease is really quite low, at least in high resource settings now. It's less than two cases per thousand person years of follow-up, and it remains that low even in people who are not accessing antiretroviral therapy and present late. And therefore, there have been a number of studies that have suggested, both in a randomized clinical trial and in observational cohort studies that primary prophylaxis for MAC in adults and adolescents who are able to immediately initiate ART does not add further to benefit in prevent in mortality and morbidity in people with HIV. And so currently we do not recommend primary prophylaxis and our first recommendation is to immediately start antiretroviral therapy. If that is not possible, or if patients are reluctant to use ART, do not have access to it, or fail to respond to it, indications for primary prophylaxis include a CD4 count of less than 50, not receiving antiretroviral therapy, as I've just highlighted, or in individuals who remain viremic on ART, but or do not have options for fully suppressive ART. 
It's important if you're going to consider primary prophylaxis for MAC to rule out disseminated MAC first by getting a blood culture, checking for symptoms, and doing other uh, nonspecific screening to look for signs and symptoms of MAC before you initiate primary prophylaxis. And this has to do with the rate, the high rate of drug resistance, as I highlighted earlier, in to macrolides if they are used in the setting of primary prophylaxis um, when you already have disseminated disease or if you fail primary prophylaxis and develop disseminated disease. The preferred regimens for prevention of MAC disease, if you're going to use it, include azithromycin or clarithromycin. There are two different dose recommendations for azithromycin and a daily dose recommendation for clarithromycin. Most people in clinical practice now do not use clarithromycin because of this azithromycin tends to be better tolerated and you can use it less frequently. And it may be associated with fewer drug-drug interactions than clarithromycin. An alternative regimen for people who either um, might have resistance to azithromycin or clarithromycin or have side effects or adverse effects that prevent their ability to use these would be rifabutin, although it of course has its own um, issues with drug-drug interactions. If you use rifabutin for primary prophylaxis, obviously you need to rule out tuberculosis first because you don't want to use uh, rifamycin monotherapy in the setting of active TB. If you use primary prophylaxis and are thinking about stopping it, you, the indication for discontinuing primary prophylaxis is if the patient can eventually be started on a fully suppressive ART regimen and have a CD4 count response to greater than 100. So I'm just going to uh, go back to this slide and see if this uh, discussion has changed your opinion about what's the most appropriate therapy for disseminated MAC in this setting. And this is your post-test response. And yay! So most of you were paying attention, thank you. And that is the correct response. So I'm going to stop there and we're gonna go on to our Q&A session and turn it back over to Dr. Bedimo to moderate the Q&A. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation, Dr. Benson. And I can see that some of the questions came before you finish. So I'm very certain that you have already answered them, but here they are none, nonetheless. Uh, two questions on prevention that came before your pre prevention slides. In my country, the incidence of MAC is very low and the risk of development of uh, azithromycin resistance could be high. Actually, do you use this for prevention? So I think the uh, issue in low and middle income countries is that the rate of tuberculosis is so high or the prevalence of tuberculosis is so, tuberculosis is so high that many of us believe that it sort of masks the occurrence of MAC disease. And it's been true throughout the HIV pandemic in low and middle income countries that we do not see MAC very often. So I think that um, the issue of primary prophylaxis is probably not as critical in that setting. And we generally do not recommend, and I don't believe the WHO recommends, routinely using MAC prophylaxis. Although if you have a patient with a very low CD4 count, you have them on other primary prophylaxis for TB and pneumocystis, and you think there is a, ri a risk of MAC disease in your setting, it still might be something you'd consider. Um, the risk of development of resistance is high, but that would require that your participant or your patient would be failing MAC prophylaxis. And if you're able to start them on antiretroviral therapy, that's really a more important preventive intervention than using primary prophylaxis for MAC. 
Uh, uh, rapidly, another question on prevention. Uh, do you recommend azithromycin for people with low CD4 count on ART but poor adherence? He said, I believe the guidelines just say if they are on ART, then we shouldn't give prophylaxis. So what if you're not certain of their adherence? <laughs> <laughs> well, adherence is the bane of all of our existence yeah. for uh, people with uh, in our clinics. So... Uh, Usually people, even in the setting of ART that's not fully suppressive, there's a pretty low incidence of disseminated MAC. And your concern, if the patients aren't responding to or not adhering to antiretroviral therapy, they may also not adhere to primary prophylaxis for MAC. And so I, again, I think the more important approach is trying to um, support adherence to antiretroviral therapy than to get them on primary prophylaxis for MAC. All right, so two questions on culture. One is comment about the culture technique for MAC in bone marrow. And the second one uh, is uh, <laughs> about the shortage of blood culture bottles in the US. <laughs> well, those are the response to this is, re is uh, related to both of Perfect. those issues. So the culture technique for MAC from the bone marrow is if you're doing a bone marrow aspirate, you take a, a syringe and you put part of that aspirate into AFB blood culture bottles. So that uh, presupposes that you have access to AFB blood culture bottles. And yes, there is a shortage of these. Um, our hospital has announced this. So you have to request, specifically request this from the ID service. It's yet another thing, for, reason for the ID people to weigh in on in inpatients. And so it may be difficult in several settings to have access to blood and bone marrow cultures. Yeah. And we are always you, uh, looking for ways to justify existence in ID. So <laughs> that's one. Yeah. So now final question, how do you rule out TB in someone who has a CD4 count of less than 50 prior to using rafabutin as an alternative therapy? Well, our most important way of ruling out TB is uh, sputum aspirate for um, AFB smear and culture and using a rapid test like an uh, Cepheid um, gene expert test on sputum or in bloodstream. All right, I believe- A little bit over time, so we need to we move had, on. Uh, but thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. So I will turn it over to you.